I always tell people, if you don't keep boys busy, things break. And that's very true. And so that's why for um, back a few years ago, my wife was at an event. I was home. It was a summer day. It was really hot. My kids were bored, and I decided, you know what, let's do an adventure. Let's, let's go have some fun, and let's work some energy out all at the same time. And so I said, we're going to go to a water park. Now, I didn't have four kids at the time. I had, I had three, and it was Asher, Emerson, and Jonas. And Asher was eight, Emerson was six, and Jonas was four. And let me just say, if you've never been to a water park and been outnumbered, you should try that. <laughs> you should try that. You are in for a transformational experience. And um, so, so we decided that we would go to a water park. Now, I, I will also say that it is, makes it especially difficult um, because I had boys, and um, most of my boys can't stay still for more than five seconds at a time. So... Of course, the, the, the worst thing that can happen in a situation like this is that a parent loses a child, which, incidentally, I did. So there was a big multi-story play structure. There were slides, and there were tunnels, and there were, like, water cannons. And I told Asher and Emerson that they could have free reign of the place and have a really good time in this area right? Now, I would be with Jonas, who was four, and he needed me to be with him, and so we were going to go on the slides that were down low and do some of the more kiddie stuff, but I said, Asher and Emerson, you guys just have free reign. Have fun, but stay here, and there's this interesting phenomenon that happens when perfectly clear instructions come out of the mouth of a parent, between the time that it comes out and it goes into the child's ear, right? And you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And it's the scrambling thing that happens. Because what I said to Emerson was, don't leave this area. And what he heard was, wah, 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 right? <laughs> so anyway, Emerson ended up getting lost. It was about 15 minutes of frantic running around. I was dragging Jonas by the arm. Um, I had asked Asher to run all over the, the, the place structure um, looking for him, and we finally found him, crisis averted, um, and we got him back. Charlie asked me today to talk to dads on this Father's Day about ways that we can up our game, and I'm really excited to do that. It's something that I'm pretty passionate about. But I tell you that story right up front to let you know something that I really hope you already know, and that is that none of us are going to get it all right. But just because we aren't perfect doesn't mean we can put our parenting into autopilot either. We should strive to give our kids the best that we can offer them. Unfortunately, there's no self-driving Teslas in being a dad. So I want to talk to you not about being a perfect dad, but about being an influential one. This message that I want to share with you today, I really boiled down into four main points, four handles to help you up your game. But, but what I think is interesting about these four strategies is that dads often overlook them. And I know because I have and I do. So we're really learning this together. Quick disclaimer, I, I know a lot of you are not dads. You may have dad. You may have kids that are grown. Um, you may um, be a mom. Uh, you you may not have children. Uh, but look, we all influence people. We all influence people, and so I really want you to think about these handles in light of your context. They're for you too. All right, our first handle for the morning: an influential dad is connected. An influential dad is connected. It is our job as a dad to connect with our children on a heart level. My wife and I did ministry in Arizona for about uh, nine years. And um, 
uh, during that time, I was an associate pastor, and my wife was the worship pastor. It was a typical Sunday morning. We only had Asher at the time. Uh, we had him packed up in the stroller, everything ready to go for our Sunday morning uh, trip to the church. And we were coming in uh, early that Sunday morning. I was headed to the courtyard to get that set up for services. My wife was going in to do worship and band practice, get that started. And one of our extremely faithful volunteers uh, met me in the courtyard, and his name is John. Now, John is from Korea. Uh, English is not his first language, and so he struggles a bit with uh, communication. And in his broken way, he was trying to give us a compliment about Asher. Now, a couple characteristics about Asher. Asher had these really big, beautiful eyes as a kid. He still does, um, but... Um, he had big, beautiful eyes. Well, he also was a little chunkster, right? I mean, his arms and legs looked like you had put rubber bands on them, right? And um, so we were rolling in, and, he, and, and John said, ah, and pointed to his eyes and said, like Pastor Mary Beth. And that would have been fine and well if he had stopped there. But then he proceeded to grab a fat roll off of his leg and said, ha ha, Pastor Chris. <laughs> so we still laugh about that story. It's no, it's no secret that my kids look like me. My boys, really, they do look like me. But my kids can carry my genes and never be connected to my heart. And that's what I want to talk to you about. There's a scripture in Malachi 6 that says, He will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. And what's interesting about this verse is where it comes. So at the end of the, the Old Testament, so God has done some amazing works, and it's recorded in the Old Testament from creation to the promise, the covenant, through the prophets. And he ends that with a look into the future, with an optimistic look into the future. And what he says is, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And what I love about this is that there's an implication that that relationship is broken. And he points us to that. And so I ask the question, I, I, this is a bit obvious, but I want to say it anyway. God is honored in our healthy relationships. Did you know that? He wants us to have healthy relationships. And that parent-child relationship is so important. See, sometimes we wrongly assume that honoring God is something that we do, but it's actually something that we are. And healthy relationships are an example of that. So today I want to go over a few simple ways that we can connect better with our kids. Number one, build margin in your life. Build margin in your life. Busyness is the enemy of relationships. Don't know if you knew that. And yet in our world, we feel like we always need to be doing, always need to be going. But it's interesting that relationships aren't built during peak moments. They're built in the in-between times when you're waiting, when you're sitting, when you're eating, when you're in the car. You see, we can fill these times with busyness, but I encourage you, don't. Don't fill these times with checking email and social media. Leave some empty time so that relationships can be built, so that conversations can be had, and so that intimacy can be gained. Where there is no margin, it's our relationships that suffer the most. So build downtime in your schedule. And the second part of that is don't fill up the downtime that you already have with busyness. Build margin in your life. All right. Second way that we want to connect is eat screenless meals together. Eat screenless meals together. We want to eat screenless meals without, um, uh, with our kids as often 
as we can. Uh, look, I know that's I know that's not always possible. Okay, we live in a, a a very very advanced kind of society, and one of the cool things that we have going for us is that many of us have flexibility in our jobs because we can work from our phones, work from our laptops, work from home. Okay, so there's no judgment, there's grace here. But I wanna encourage you that a large number of studies investigate the positive mental and physical benefits of frequent screenless meals together. They show that the amount of time kids spend together during family meals is strongly correlated with academic achievement, fewer behavioral problems, less obesity, reduced rates of teen smoking, drinking, and drug use. Eat together with your kids and put the phone down. Number three, become an active listener, especially right before bed. I don't know about you, but by the time bedtime rolls around, um, I am tired. I am at the, the end of my rope. And the last thing I want to do is actively listen. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, boys. <laughs> oh, gosh. I know I totally missed my, my place. Um, but when we rush these moments, we miss a huge window into our children's world. On the other hand, when we listen well, we will be amazed at the things that our kids tell us will be amazed at how we are connecting with our kids' hearts. So I'm a part of a group, and it's called CLC. It's a men's group, Christian Leadership Concepts, and we're in a, a, a two-year program. And this is the third group of this, uh, like this at uh, Gateway. And we meet every Wednesday morning. And in this particular group, there's a lot of dads of young kids. So the topic of being a dad, being a good dad, comes up a lot. And so one of the things that we're working on, all of us are, are really trying to be intentional about listening, about being attentive, and especially in those moments right before bed. One of our guys came in the other day, and he said, it's working. And we're like, what's working? And he said, I talked to my, my daughter just yesterday. I was sitting on her bed, and I was listening to her, and she told me, that Marcy was mean to her on the playground yesterday. And I don't even know who Marcy is, right? But I'm so excited that I'm getting into her heart, that I'm finding out what's important to her, that I'm able to identify and kind of be in her world. And that's stuff that I wouldn't have known had I not been present in that moment. So he was so excited. I have a reminder in my phone that goes off at 8 p.m. every night that says, listen to their hearts. And it's just a reminder to be present in those moments. Now, look, I can't be present all the time, and neither can you. But when we are present, we can be present if we choose to. Become an active listener, especially right before bed. All right, that finishes up. An influential dad is connected. Our second handle for the day is an influential dad is vulnerable. An influential dad is vulnerable. A few years ago, we had a pretty rough day around our house. My wife and I, Mary Beth, uh, we, were, we were impatient. Um, our kids were pushing boundaries and limits left and right. And I got angry. I lost my cool. And I said some things to especially my, my oldest son, Asher, uh, that I shouldn't have said. I was just speaking harshly to him. And um, that night, I sat on his bed and I said, hey, Asher, I wasn't a very good dad to you today. And I just want to apologize. I want to apologize for that. The reason I tell you that story is because a few weeks later, um, we had a, a, a bit of an attitude problem with Asher. It's nothing beyond what normal kids do. Um, we dealt with it in the moment. But that night, as Mary Beth and I were laying down to go to sleep, I heard steps, um, footsteps down the stairs. And um, I looked up to see Asher standing in the doorway with big tears in his eyes. And he said, 
mom and dad, I, I wasn't very nice to you guys today. And I just want to say I'm sorry. And that was my boy apologizing. You see, one of the things that I learned through Asher's apology is that we need to model the behavior that we want to see in our kids. We have to show them what reconciling and restoring relationships looks like. We need to show them how to say, I'm sorry. Look, we all want intimacy with our kids, but there's no intimacy without vulnerability. Some of us need to be courageous enough to be vulnerable with our kids. And by the way, that works in other relationships too, as a sidebar. All right, so I want to give you three ways that we can do a better job of being vulnerable with our kids. Number one, let your kids see you say, I'm sorry. I think this is tough. I think this is tough for dads um, because we have to be strong. Unfortunately, that's kind of the culture that we live in, but, but we can remake that. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And I am amazed at how saying I'm sorry and meaning it heals relationships. Number two, let your kids see you ask for help. James 1.5 says, if anyone needs wisdom, ask for it. But how will they know how to ask for wisdom if we don't show them? How will they know? how to ask for help if we don't model it. But see, one of the cool things about modeling it is that then they realize through that that they don't have to be strong enough to, go, to deal with everything, right? They can ask for help and you give them freedom to do that. Let your kids see you ask for help. And, and the last one is let your kids see you get back up when you fall. Proverbs twenty four sixteen says, for though a, <laughs> I'm going to say this real quick, and then I'm going to stop. <laughs> For a righteous man falls seven times, he will rise again. Um, I've got my dad here today. And he's accomplished. He's accomplished a lot in his life. But the thing that he did most for me is he showed me how to get back up when he falls. And I'm a stronger man because of it. Okay, moving on. An influential dad is vulnerable. All right, that third handle. An influential dad is not alone. It is our job to create a God-pursuing community around our kids. I had some incredible mentors when I was in my young 20s. It was a husband and wife pastor team, and they invested in my life immensely. And they are one of the big reasons why I am in ministry today. They would have me over for dinners, movies, family functions. And I was so blessed by my time with their family. They had two boys, teenagers, by the time we met. And it wasn't until years after their boys were grown that Nate and Tammy pulled me aside and told me how having me around their boys was intentional. It was after a church, or a church event, and I remember Tammy crying as she told me, Chris, we meant for you to get close to and influence our sons because they look up to you and because we trusted your heart. You see, this doesn't make sense yet, but it will after you become a dad. Our influence with our children fades, fades as, as they grow older and become more independent. And that's not a bad thing. It's by design. But other influences increase. And you were one of those other influences that helped our kids get a start in the right direction. So when you are a dad, 
find mentors who they look up to you or who they look up to and who you trust and help them to be a part of your kids' lives. They had intentionally set up a God-pursuing community around their sons. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. But instead of talking about a cord of three strands, I want to talk about a triangle with three corners with your child in the middle. And that kind of community that we can set up around our kids is not easily broken. So we want to build a community around our kids that includes God-pursuing mentors. This first one over here. And that's related to the story that I just told. We want to set up a community around our kids that includes a God-pursuing church. And I got to tell you, I am thankful for Gateway for this very reason. There is some amazing ministry that is going on here. And I'm going to brag on these guys, and they're probably going to be upset at me, but, but Pastor Jen and Pastor Craig, bar none, are some of the best pastors I've ever known. Uh, they do some amazing work. And I just want to encourage you, if your kids are not involved in their ministries, get them involved. And what's more, you get involved in the ministry too. They can use you. And the third part of that is, we need to be God-pursuing parents. No, I didn't leave you out. It, we are a big part of this process. And we have to model the behavior that we want to see in our kids. Okay, quick sidebar. If you have preteens and teens, you can't research all of the, the things about culture, okay? It is hard keeping up with everything. And so I just want to point you to a website. Again, this is a sidebar, but AXIS, A-X-I-S, A-X-I-S dot org. Sign up for their newsletter. And I want to encourage you as a mom or a dad, they help you to understand culture. They help you to understand devices. They help you to understand safety in a way that you probably don't right now. They give you a window into your kid's world. So if that's your age group, um, I, want, I want you to, to check out their website, please. An influential dad is not alone. Number four, an influential dad gives a blessing. It's a dad's job to pass along a blessing to their children. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And often an inheritance, we, we think of money, right? We think of resources, but I don't want to refer to that. I want to talk about a legacy. I want to talk about a blessing that you can leave your kids. A friend of mine told me... Um, how he was abused as a child by his dad. The abuse started when he was five and it lasted for years. And as he's telling me the story, my heart's breaking. And I said, in light of what you've been given, and this guy has great kids, great kids. And I said, in light of what you've been given, how was it that you were able to give your kids something more in a dad? And you know what he said to me? He said, I decided that the curse would stop with me. And I would give them something more. This statement blew me away. Because do you see what he's doing? He's bearing the burden of restoration and not simply passing it along for his children to bear. Talk about passing along a blessing to your kids. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. And the implied question there is, what will you choose for you and your family? What blessings do you need to pass along to your children? 
and what curses need to stop with you. Some of us were given a great upbringing and some of us faced far more challenges, but we all decide what we will leave to the next generation. Maybe we need to stop the curse of unforgiveness and leave our children the blessing of reconciliation. Some of us may need to stop the cycle of harmful habits and leave our children the blessing of dependence on Christ. Some of us need to stop bitterness, maybe resentment, maybe anger, maybe anxiety, maybe even the pursuit of selfish gain, and instead leave our children something more to hold on to. (laughs) An influential dad, he gives a blessing. So to wrap this up, here's my point. We're not going to get all this right. But as we partner with the Holy Spirit to raise our kids, we can make a difference that will last through tough seasons. And let me tell you, we need grace for our kids, but we need a lot of grace for our parenting for when those tough times come. My friend and discipleship pastor, Heather Zimpel, says that what we do for a few always has more potential than what we do for many. Said another way, we can influence many people marginally, but we can influence a few people greatly. Andy Stanley says it like this, your greatest contribution to the world may not be something that you do, but someone that you raise. For us, we'll add to that someone that you mentor. Maybe it's someone that you disciple. So who are your few? Will you become an agent for change in their lives? One of my favorite definitions of a leader is that they change the world around them. And isn't that exactly what Christ did when he left the comfort of heaven and stepped into our messed up world? He changed it by being here, by showing up. And he calls us to follow him in that. When I lost Emerson at the water park, sorry, Mary Beth. (laughs) Look, I'm not even going to tell you about when I lost him at Disney World, okay? (laughs) I was panicked, of course. I couldn't imagine how my little boy must have been feeling, though. And after it seemed like forever searching, I rounded a corner to see my six-year-old son walking with one of the lifeguards. I spotted him first. But when he saw me, that brave face that he had put on his face, it broke. And he took off into a run and and with tears streaming down his face. He ran to me and I picked him up in my arms and, and he held on to me as tight as anything he's ever held on before. And he was safe again. Today, some of you need to run back to your father. Maybe you've been lost, or maybe you just need some help. Maybe you need to run back to him so that he can help you be a better dad, a better influencer. But let me tell you, the people around you need you to run back to him. And the people that are closest to you, they need you to run back to him the most. It's never too late. C.S. Lewis says, start where you are and change the ending. So will you? Jason, would you come, come on up? So just to review, an influential dad is connected. We must connect with our kids on a heart level. Number two, an influential dad is vulnerable. Our children identify with our realness, not with our perfection. An influential dad is not alone. It's our job to create a God-pursuing community around our kids. And an influential dad, he really does give a blessing. 
We don't get to decide what we're given in life, but we all get to decide what we give. Father, we come to you today and we recognize that the only perfect father is you. Lord, thank you for fathering us and thank you for fathering us patiently. We need that. We need your grace. Lord, I pray for the people in this room that you would speak to their hearts and Holy Spirit, that you would work in them to carry away something that they can apply and, 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 and tweak and make uh, adjustments in where they're headed. Lord, you call us all to that. And I pray that we would have the strength and the confidence and the courage to do what you are calling us to do. We thank you so much for your presence here today. In your name I pray, amen. Before we go, I want to offer a blessing to you and, and because the topic of being a dad, being an influential dad, I thought it might be cool for me to give you a blessing pray the same prayer that I pray over my boys most nights. It's based on a description of Jesus' life in Luke 2.52. So if you guys would stand for the benediction, I want to offer that to you. May you grow in wisdom and in strength. And may you grow in favor with God and with people. Happy Father's Day. Have a great week.